Hello, welcome to Project 152, your weekly exam prep. Now, every week we go through past questions from QCAA external exams. If you stick with us from now until the end of the year, you'll have done every single question that they've ever released. Now, this is week 12. Uh, it's a tech active one, so get your calculator out, and here we go. So here's the first question, and we've got some sort of vector equation, and they're asking, what's the path of the particle? Which one of these works? So we take this vector equation and we should be able to essentially plug it straight into our calculator. Now to plug it into our calculator, we're going to create a parametric equation out of this. So we've got x equals cos t. And we've got y equals negative 2 sine t. Something like that. Let's plug that into our calculator. So I'm in graphing mode here. And I've put it into degrees mode here. I like working in degrees because I can just think a little clearer in degrees. Nothing's going to break if I work in degrees here. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to type this in. But first I need to switch from y equals to parametric mode. So I just change my type of graph into a parametric graph. And now I just type my graphs in. So I have cos, and then this is where we're going to find our t value and then execute that, and then negative 2 sine t, and then we execute that. All right, let's see what happens when we draw it. Okay, and we get what looks like a perfect circle, uh, but it's not a perfect circle, right? Because this says 2, and this says 1, so the answer is this one here, 2 and 1. The answer for this question is D. Now, I just want to talk about the calculator just for a little bit longer. So some things here that you might want to be aware of, if you click on your view window here, you get your minimums and maximums like you always do, but you also get minimums and maximums for your T value, which is important. You might need to work with that. If I went 0 to 180, let's say, and drew that, you can see I get half of my circle because it's only traveling from 0 to 180. I could make it bigger, in which case it's going to keep rotating around, around, around. So something to keep in mind. The other thing that you might find very useful in certain instances is being able to use this trace function, being able to trace time, x-coordinate, and y-coordinate as well. Very useful when you're dealing with like vector equations, things like that. But that's it. Option D is our answer. Let's celebrate and move on to our next question. All right, so a pretty classic one here. We've got a dominance matrix style question, and we just need to be able to type this dominance matrix into our calculator, do the calculation, and then see which of these is the correct ranking for our teams. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do this, but I'm going to uh, save this matrix as an actual matrix. So I'm going to click here, and I'm going to save it as map A. Uh, it's going to be a 4 by 4 and I just type in my numbers there. All right, that's it. That's great. That's saved now. So execute out of exit out of there, and I've got my mat A saved, and I'll be able to use that. All right, let's exit out of there now. Now, as usual, you can sort of get a little bit lost here, but we need to do some sort of calculation, right? So I'm going to go option, uh, mat, and then mat, uh, and then we need the capital A, wherever that's hiding, capital A. So we're going to do mat A plus plus 0 0.5 uh, times, and I'm going to put in brackets here, mat A, and then square it. So another mat A, um, alpha A, and square it. All right, hopefully, if I've done all that right, we should get an immediate answer. 0, 1, da, 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 da. Now, for numbers as small as this, we can just kind of add up across the row. Uh, 1, 1 1.5, and 1, that's 3.5 for our first one, and the next one is 2, and the next one is 1 1.5, and the next one is 3. And so that means first place goes to whoever the first one, which is P, Last, uh, second place goes to this one, which is S, and third place goes to this one, which is Q. I believe our answer is P, S, Q. Let's take a look. Yes, it is. Now, mainly so I don't get called out in the comments, I will mention that rather than adding them up by hand here, you can do something uh, a little bit clever. So you can say, okay, I want to do mat shift 
answer. Now that just takes our answer there and brings it down to here. And then I'm going to multiply it by a 4 by 1 matrix. Now to get that 4 by 1 matrix, I'm just going to exit out of all this stuff. Click on my math here, click on this matrix one, and enter a 4 by 1. And the 4 by 1 is just going to be 1, 1, 1, 1. Alright, that has the effect of just adding it up, just like I've done there. Um, another neat way of doing it, just let you know it exists, it's a thing. Let's celebrate, and there's only one last question today. Alright, so we've got a big old vector calculus question going on here. Uh, what's going on? So we've got the ground, so let me draw the ground in. There's the ground, and we're going to launch an object from the ground. Now, we're launching it at an angle of 54 degrees, so 54 degree angle there, and we're told that the initial velocity is 15 meters per second. Okay, uh, now what else are we told? We're told that that's our initial launch angle. Now, the object is going to fly through the air, right, and it it's going to just pass over a drone, and it says that you're standing directly below the drone. There's our drone. Uh, and what else do we have? Horizontal distance of 20 meters. 20 meters. Okay, so that's everything we've got to go with. Now, my drawing is a little bit misleading because I don't know, I've sort of drawn it as if it's hitting a turning point at this drone. I, I don't know that that's true. It could be like really flying straight through the drone or it could be like already have peaked and be going back down again. And that's kind of what the question's asking us. Is it taking off like this or is it going up and back down again? We've got to be able to describe the motion of this particle with respect to this little drone that's sitting right here. Okay, in order to do that, really what you want to do, and in any kind of question like this, you want to create three equations, an acceleration one, a velocity one, and a displacement one. Now, the acceleration one, super straightforward. It's negative 9.8j because we're on Earth and gravity and all of that stuff. All right, so the velocity next is going to be equal to the integral of acceleration, integral of 9.8j with respect to t. Now, that is going to be equal to whatever the integral of that is, which is negative 9.8tj plus some unknown c value. Now that c value, because we've got this nice linear thing here, at time zero, that's going to be zero, which means that our c value is the initial velocity, the initial velocity. And we actually have the initial velocity because we're told a launch angle and a launch velocity as well. So that C value becomes 15 cos 54i. Now why this? Because that represents the horizontal velocity at time zero, right? That gives us this, this length right here. And this bit, 15 sine 54j, that gives us the vertical velocity at time zero. Okay, we can probably rearrange this to group these J's and put our I out the front. All right, that is our velocity equation right there. I'll write it there. That's my velocity equation. Now, important to note, 15 cos 54 is a number, and 15 sine 54 is a number. You could just type that into your calculator and come up with some decimal approximation for that and just put that there, something, 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 I, as a number. You could put this here as a number as well. I'm choosing not to because there's no real need to calculate those at this stage. And if I put a number in there, then I'm just going to end up rounding it, etc. So I'm going to leave it how it is. Okay, now that I have a velocity function, I can find the integral of that, which will give me my displacement function. All right, so let's be a little bit careful here. We're finding the integral of this velocity function. Now, the integral of this, remember, that's a number. So don't go turning it into sine or something. It's still just that number. T, oh, T, I. Okay, and then we've got this stuff all in brackets. Now, again, this is just a number. So we have 15 sine 54 T. Let's put that in brackets. And then this is 9.8 T squared divided by 2. So that's 4.9 T squared. You should have seen this happen a million times by now. So that shouldn't be a surprise to you. Now we've got a j there, 
and then we've got some sort of plus C on the end because we've integrated. Now, pretty straightforward, because the initial displacement, if we treat this point as zero, zero, and that's kind of an assumption that we can make, we're letting the position at time equal zero be zero I plus zero J. That's our initial displacement here. So our displacement function is simply going to be this without the C. All right, so I'm done now. I've got these three, one, two, and three. I've got these functions that I really needed. So what's the question? What am I actually trying to figure out? Well, we don't know the height of the drone. We're not really interested in the height of the drone, right? What we're interested in is these observer comments. It says it took the object around 2 to 2.5 seconds after its projection to reach the drone. All right, what do I mean when I say I'm not interested in the height of the drone? Well, we do know that the drone is 20 meters horizontally from the starting position. So if we could find the time at which our object is 20 meters horizontally from the starting position, then we would know when it was passing over the drone. And this happens a lot in uh, these sorts of projectile motion questions where you're not interested in the entire displacement function. You're only really interested in the I proportion of the vector projection. So we're interested in at what time does this value, does our horizontal displacement equal 20? So I'm going to let the displacement function equal 20. Let's be a bit more specific here. The I component of the X displacement equal 20. So 20 equals 15 cos 52. I guess there's some I's here, but they're going to cancel out anyway. So we're just left with 20 equals 15 cos 54 T. Now 15 cos 54 T is just a number. So 20 divided by 15 cos 54 equals T. And I can just solve that on any old calculator. So when I do that, I get an answer of T equals 2.26 seconds. If you didn't get that when you typed it into your calculator, it's because your calculator is in radians mode. Switch it over to degrees because we're working in degrees. You can see that. So why is that interesting? Well, it took the object around 2 to 2.5 seconds after the projection to reach the drone. Yes, I believe so. I believe that observation is accurate um, because my answer is 2.26, which is almost smack dab in the middle between 2 and 2.5 seconds. The other thing that the observer said was, the object was still moving in an upwards direction as it passed the drone. Okay, how can I test that assumption? How can I say, well, I'm not, I don't know if you're right or not. Maybe it wasn't, but think about the ways that this object can meet our drone. This object can start here, fly off into the sky, come back down and hit the drone, or fly just above it, or it can be moving upwards, as it passes over the drone and the turning point can be over there somewhere. So either the turning point is on this side of the drone or the turning point is on this side of the drone. Either way, if I know where the turning point is, how far across the turning point is, then I'll know whether it was on the way down or on the way up when it passed over that drone. Now, how do I find the turning point of something? Well, it's vertical velocity at the turning point will be equal to zero. Its velocity, its vertical velocity will be equal to zero at the turning point. So I'm letting the J component of the velocity function equal zero. So I'm letting this equal zero. Now remember, this is a number uh, so I can move it over to here and then divide by 9.8 and I'll be able to just solve this Pretty straightforward. Now when I rearrange this and solve it, I get a T value of 1.24. Okay, what is that T value of 1.24? What does it represent? That is the time at which the vertical velocity was zero, i.e. the turning point, the maximum height of our thing. Now we know that it took 2.26 seconds for it to get to just above the drone, to get to the drone. So if the turning point was at 1.24 seconds, then the turning point occurred before it was at the drone. Now, what did our observer say? The object was still moving in an upwards direction as it passed the drone. No, no, incorrect. You've 
your eyes have betrayed you. It was going downwards because it turned, its turning point was up here somewhere. All right? So we can say that the, the upshot here is that it peaked, it had a maximum height before it reached the drone. A good way to sort of communicate this is to say that 1.24 seconds is less than 2.26 seconds. Therefore, its max height was before it reached the drone. Okay, now what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to evaluate the reasonableness of the observer's comment. So I'll just do this verbally. Evaluating the reasonableness of the observer's comment. Uh, now, there were two comments that the observer made. It took the object around 2 to 2.5 seconds after the projection to reach the drone. That comment is reasonable. Our answer was 2.26 seconds. That's between 2 and 2.5. That's a reasonable comment to make. However, the comment that it was still moving upwards when it reached the drone is not a reasonable comment to make for this reason right here. It peaked at 1.24 seconds well before when it reached the drone at 2.26 seconds. Evaluation complete. Let me just put something on the screen. That's the QCAA's sort of evaluation statement. Also note that in this question, the QCAA gave a mark for this statement, and they also gave a mark for the logical setting out of your working out. So keep an eye out for it. In every exam, they give a mark out, uh, two marks out for logical organization. It happens in a couple of questions each time. All right, I'm happy with that. Let's celebrate that. So those have been the week 12 solutions, a shorter one this week, but still very, very important. Make sure you feel free to go back and take a look at some previous questions, a really good idea at this stage. You're going to start forgetting some of that unit three content, so always a good idea to go back and take another look. Do not feel like you can't do the same question twice. I can guarantee there'll be some questions from previous weeks where you've forgotten them. Go and check them out, but also link in the description to next week's question. Go and check it out, questions, go and check them out. I'll see you then.